All right, it's time for some more discussion about things from Chapter 3. Section 2, where we're naming and giving formulas to ionic compounds. The chart in the text shows the typical um, charges that are exhibited by main group metal ions. In the left side of the periodic table, they're shown in blue on this chart. Notice the patterns are quite nice. The group 1A elements have the charge that corresponds to their group number, and group 2A also has the same number as the group number. These are for the main group metal ions. And then for group 3A, which is also known thir as 13, the charge is also the same as the group number. So for main group metal ions, the charge is very much a very easy pattern to remember. What about the nonmetals then? Well, the nonmetals are shown in red here. Notice hydrogen is also a nonmetal, which is kind of an anomaly. It occurs on the left side of the periodic table, but it does not behave like a metal. So it is honestly a nonmetal, which is a little confusing. It will have some patterns that um, conform to those of group 1A and sometimes those of group 7A. So some periodic tables show it in both places. Um, nevertheless, you can see that hydrogen does occur with two different charges, and most often we'll see it with H+. Plus. Occasionally, H- minus will come up. We'll have to talk about that more with time. So what are the charges for the nonmetal ions on the right side of the periodic table, shown in red here? There's a pattern to them. If you look, the ones in group 7A or group 17 have a charge that corresponds to um, 8 minus the group number, so it's a charge of minus 1. Group 6A is 8 minus the group number, which is a uh, charge of negative 2. And there are 3, oh, oh, sorry, 8 minus the group number gives us a charge of 3. But these are all negative charges because these are all going to be um, atoms that gain an electron when they gain, when they become ions. How that works, we'll get to as we go. Now, that's just the main group elements that we've talked about. There are group numbers give us a clue about the charges we expect for their ions. What about the middle section of the periodic table? Well, those transition metals are rather less predictable and it's considerably um, more frustrating to freshmen or general chemistry students. Notice that there are several elements in the transition metals which have more than one possible cation. The cations are the positively charged ions here. We'll talk about them more. And there's things like vanadium, chromium, iron, and um, say vanadium, chromium, iron, and copper, and then there's mercury, which is another interesting one, that have multiple common cations, and it's not going to be readily predicted. So you will not know for sure what charges transition metals will exhibit. We'll have to have use other clues to know what charges are expected. We'll use names and formulas to figure them out. Okay, so here's a representation of the ionic compound sodium chloride, where you have two kinds of ions, sodium ions and chloride ions. Either you can use a ball and stick kind of representation as shown on the left, or a close packed sphere arrangement in the center, or that right image actually shows a small uh, magnified view of salt crystals. So what's happening in an ionic compound? The ionic compound should consist of a combination of cations with anions, and this is going to happen in such a way that the sum of the charges of the cations and anions together in each formula unit has to add up to zero. So you're going to have electrically neutral combinations of cations and anions. We will have to work to make sure that the formulas of the compounds that we um, describe fit that pattern, that they add up to zero. So how will we make some formulas and make sense of them, or how do they work so that we understand what's happening in these um, descriptions? So Al2S3 must be aluminum and sulfur. And how does it work that that becomes an electrically neutral compound? Well, if you think back to where aluminum sits in the periodic table, that's in group 3 or 13A, that means its charge should be plus 3. And sulfur is in group 6A or 16, so 8 minus the group number gives you the negative charge, so it's minus 2. And so if you put them together to make electrically neutral charge, you have to think about it this, or electrically neutral compound. There's apparently two aluminum with three sulfur. So two aluminum together is 2 times a plus 3 for a plus 6 overall charge. 
and 3 of the sulfur ions times minus 2 each is minus 6. So minus 6 and plus 6 together adds up to an electrically neutral compound. Same idea will be applied as we think about magnesium and bromide. However, here's one thing to quickly notice. The charge of one ion becomes the subscript on the other ion. That's an interesting but useful way of getting the charges to correlate to subscripts and getting them right. So we'll think about that. So does that work for the magnesium and bromide in this next compound? Well, the magnesium is from group 2A, and group 2A elements are going to have a charge of plus 2, which correlates to the uh, subscript on the bromine in this particular example. So we should see plus 2 for the magnesium, which is correct. And then the charge on the bromine ion goes with everything else in group 7A, where they're only going to have a single positive charge. And so I did I put my arrow in a funny spot. So the magnesium charge gives us the subscript on the bromine, and the bromine charge gives us a subscript on the magnesium, which doesn't have one, which means it's only one. So the charge on bromide is minus one. I put my arrows in funny there, sorry about that. So how does that work? Two, one magnesium, two bromide. In other words, one of the plus two is a total of two positive charges, and two of the minus one is a total of two negative charges, so one formula unit comes out electrically neutral. Okay, so let's do my arrow thing and get it right this time. So with sodium um, and oxygen together in a compound, sodium is a group 1A element, and so it should have a plus one charge. The oxygen is a group 6A or 16 element, and so it should be eight minus the group number for the negative two charge, just like sulfur actually. And so the charge on the sodium gives you the subscript on oxygen. The charge on the oxygen gives you the subscript on the sodium. This does work, um, but remember, well, you'll discover that we're only going to use simplest whole number ratios, so sometimes they will be able to be simplified. And verify how that works. So you have two sodium with a plus two, or a total of two, char two positive charges in this compound for each formula, and one oxygen with a minus two for a total of minus two, or negative two charges. Combine that, and it's electrically neutral. You will have lots of excuses to do practice of this on various assignments. Get good at it, figuring out how the compound formulas work. All right, so how do we name these things? And I've sort of um, hinted at it as we've talked about them here. So you're going to name ionic compounds. If, if there are two portions, there's going to be a cation, and there's going to be an anion. The cation comes from metal. The anion comes from nonmetals, and sometimes polyatomic ions. We'll get to them in a little bit. And all you do is you put the two together. You're going to put a cation name first and the anion name second. The very simplest example that most people can relate to is good old sodium chloride table salt. And what do you have there? You just say the name of the sodium ion, and the chloride is the um, second ion. And we'll notice that the anions are going to get I, D, E endings for most of the simple anions. The polyatomic ions are their own interesting bunch, and we'll get used to them mostly by um, sheer repetition, and eventually we just have to memorize some of them. There will be times we'll include something more in the names, and those will be Roman numerals, when transition metal cations are included, because we won't know for sure what charge those ions are going to have, and so their name needs to represent it. The charge is going to be represented by the Roman numeral. Roman numerals, just like they used for the Super Bowl, even though that seems like it's kind of a funny, out-of-date thing, Roman numerals are used here, too. There are older, an older system of names that uses um, IC or OUS endings, like ferric and ferrous would be for two forms of iron, but we're not going to use those. Those are becoming less common, and so we will uh, prefer to stick to the ones that include the Roman numerals instead. All right, so think about how this works again. It's the ionic compound is going to be electrically neutral. The total of the positive charges has to equal the total of the negative charges. And the compounds we're looking at for the time being are going to be described as binary because they have two elements in them. And so if you're putting sodium and chloride together and thinking about how the name works, well, it's because you have one sodium ion and a chloride ion that's electrically neutral when you have one of each. And that's all you say in the name is just the cation and the anion is an IDE ending, and that's chloride. So magnesium with an oxide, well, what do we have? Magnesium is apparently a plus two cation. Oxide is a minus two cation. 
one of each, put them together, and you have the formula that makes sense, MgO. Aluminum and sulfide. Aluminum is a plus 3 cation. Sulfide is a minus 2 cation. If you just go back to your periodic table, those patterns are very predictable and very helpful. And put them together, that's going to require 3 sulfurs and 2 aluminum to make the charge come out equal. And so you have Al2S3. More practice, the better. Okay, now what happens then? Let's do some examples that include the transition elements. The transition elements are going to be requiring those Roman numerals. Hopefully, you don't have to think too hard for the ones we use here because they're mostly um, two or three or four. I don't know that we've ever used one very often. And whatever charge on that metal is, it's going to be represented directly after the name of the metal to tell us what its charge is going to be in that compound because there's more than one possibility. Um, this will apply also to group 14 elements, which applies to tin and lead. Those are things in the group under carbon. And so you will get used to finding out that tin and lead are amongst those things that will require a Roman numeral. All right, so let's try some. Iron. Iron is a typical transition element. Iron 3 oxide could be rust. Well, let's see, iron 3. So that must be the charge is going to be represented by the Roman numeral. So that would be iron with a plus 3 as a, as a plus 3 cation. The oxide is still the ordinary oxygen anion, so it's a minus 2 anion. And to put the formula together from this name, we will have to put them in a ratio that gives us an electrically neutral compound. So the iron will occur with a 2 subscripted and the oxygen with a 3. The charge on one becomes the subscript on the other. That's kind of a fun way to do it. It kind of helps you get the right things in the right places. Some people call it cross-multiplying, well, nobody's really multiplying, but there's a pattern here that gives us formulas in the correct fashion. All right, tin. In the next example, tin-2 chloride. Tin has more than one possible cation, and so one of them is going to be tin-2, which must be plus 2. Chloride is with about every, everything else in group 7A, and it's got a minus 1 anion, so if you've got a plus 2 on the tin, in order for it to come out equal, you better have two chloride ions to go with it, so SNCl2 comes out even. Lead. Lead with fluoride. Well, in this example, we have lead 2, so that must be Pb plus 2, if you haven't remembered what lead is, but run, we'll run into it now and then. Pb is a Latin root, and if it's going to be with fluoride, that's like every other um, halogen, the group 7a elements. That's going to minus, have a minus 1 charge, so Pb2 uh, plus must combine with 2 fluoride ions. So there you go, PbF2 for lead 2 fluoride. All right, now let's look at a couple other ones just to see if we can see the contrast. So remembering that if we're looking at transition metal ionic compounds, we got to indicate the charge on the metal with Roman numerals when we're naming them. So here's two, um, a photo that represents two different iron compounds with chlorine, chloride ions. One is iron with two chlorides and one is iron with three chlorides. Well, how do we figure out what the difference is? So for FeCl2, this means that you must have two chloride ions with a total of minus two charge, so the iron has to balance out. It has to be plus two. Therefore, when we put the name together, it's going to be iron two in the parenthesis, Roman numeral two, iron two chloride. The other compound shown is the yellowish one, and that's the iron FeCl3. In this case, we have three chloride ions, Cl minus, and a total of minus three minus charge, so the iron with that three chloride set of three chloride ions must be a plus three charge and so we'll name it as iron parenthesis roman numeral three chloride one other example for kicks which isn't an iron example but let's do it it's chromium another transition element that is an unpredictable charge but you can deduce it from this example so here we're going to have what some sulfur is the anion sulfide and the charge on sulfide is minus two but there's three of them so that's a total of minus six, six negative charges in that formula. So the two chromiums together have to be a total of six. So divide it by two, and each chromium must be plus three. The name is therefore going to be chromium uh, with a Roman numeral to tell us the charge is plus three, namely chromium three sulfide. 
Notice there is nothing else specified on the sulfide or the chloride in each of these examples because it's not required. We use these formulas in such a fashion that they come out to be electrically neutral. Okay, there are these other interesting entities called polyatomic ions. They have many, as in at least two, ion, atoms combined to make one molecular ion with a given charge to them. These seem bewildering at first because it's quite a, an extensive and maybe unfamiliar list to you. There will, more time we work with them, the more familiar they will become, and I'll, we'll talk about some ways to make some more simple than others. You will notice that many of them have endings that are um, A-T-E or I-T-E, so those are very common here. Um, and there are various variations. Nitrate and nitrite are two things with nitrogen and oxygen with similar charges. Chlorate and chlorite are two with chlorine and oxygen in similar charges, but then there's hypochlorite and perchlorate. Those are four of them with oxygen and chlorine, and they all have a minus one charge. Interesting. Something you can have to use to remember them a little bit. Um, so another, another eight and eight combination is sulfate and sulfite. I said it in the opposite order. But they're both a minus two charge with sulfur and oxygen. One has three and one has four. Gradually with time, you can become acquainted with them. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. It will take practice. Now, the other thing to notice here, in addition to the fact that many of them have ATE endings, almost none have an IDE ending. That's unusual. That is usually reserved for things like chloride and sulfide and oxide, single monatomic anions. And one other, two other examples, sorry, is cyanide and hydroxide. Those are the only ones um, on this list that I'm seeing that have that IDE ending, so that's unusual for this set. Um, but the rest of, the other key thing is they're primarily anions. There's only one cation that's a polyatomic ion, and that is ammonium. So it is the lonely example of a cation. With time, these will become familiar, but you will need to know them. So put a uh, mental note to get put this where you can find them as you're practicing on your homework and that'll make life easier. All right, so let's talk about those um, atoms that have, or those ions that have the same two elements together, um, such as, oh, my, my pen markings went away, the combinations of chlorine and oxygen, the combinations with nitrogen and oxygen, sulfur and oxygen, and the funny thing is they all have the same charge for the pair of elements, but different numbers of oxygen. And there's ways to remember these that I would like to talk through with you. Specifically, um, there's examples with halogens and oxygen that have four different possibilities for the number of oxygen, one through four. They all have the same charge, but slightly different names and different numbers of oxygen that go with them. So how can we remember these? Well, the one that has the most oxygen in it is going to have a per prefix in its name, per something eight. And the one that has one less oxygen is just going to be something eight. And then the one that has two less oxygens ends in ITE. And the one with the fewest oxygens is um, going to be hypo and ITE. So what example would that include? Well, that would include these four compounds with chlorine and oxygen. The most oxygenated version is perchlorate, and the second one is chlorate, the third one is chlorite, and the last one is hypochlorite. You can go back to our chart on the previous page and notice that that pattern works out exactly correct, but it's one way of remembering the pattern. This is also um, equivalent or similar ions with bromide, bromine and oxygen and iodine and oxygen to which this pattern applies which you may run into from time to time, but the pattern still works when you're trying to understand which endings go with which prefixes. All right, so in a general sense, the eight and eight is the best one to work with because it applies also to sulfate and sulfite and nitrate and nitrite. And so the one that has the more oxygens has the A-T-E ending of that pair and I-T-E is going to have fewer oxygens. Let me flip back to the previous page so you can see that. So nitrate has more oxygens than nitrite, and sulfate has more oxygens than sulfite. 
fluorate has more than chlorite. Got it? There we go. And here was our set of four with hypochlorite, chlorite, chlorate, and perchlorate. Obviously, this is in the reverse order of what's shown on the next chart. Ways to help you remember them. The other ones that you can remember with a little bit of a pattern is that if you stick hydrogen in front of something, it takes away the reduces the charge by adding an H plus to it and adding hydrogen to its name. So hydrogen, sorry, hydrogen carbonate is this one. Dihydrogen phosphate means it's got two hydrogens on there. Hydrogen phosphate is also over here where you've got one on the PO4 and without any PO, without any hydrogens, it's just phosphate. So there's phosphate, hydrogen phosphate with a charge of now of minus two instead of minus three. And dihydrogen phosphate has um, two phosphates and a single negative charge. Hydrogen carbonate is the um, analog or the hydrogenated version of carbonate, which is over there on the right. And so it's added a hydrogen to the formula and changed the, the charge from minus two to simple sig single minus. Things to help you remember. Work on them, practice them on your homework, look them up while you're getting acquainted. That's the best answer. Okay, so we talked through those. Now, so CO3 minus two has a name. We just mentioned it. It is called carbonate. So what would our pattern tell us that carbonite would be? So it's presumably going to be one less oxygen, right? And so if you have CO3, if you have one less oxygen, that sounds like CO2. But that's not an ion. That's a gas. Oh, wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. Well, here's your funny answer to this question. Does carbonite ring a bell? This is a scene from the original Star Wars movie where Luke Han Solo got frozen in carbonite. And so it's truly sci-fi. The other place you may have heard of carbonite is a um, cloud backup plan that rescues your computer if you have um, had a computer disaster. So that's one other alternate way of these names being used, which is clearly not going to show up in chemical compounds. Not a carbonite is not an ion. All right. So um, let's talk about naming polyatomic ions in compounds. Not too much different than anything we've talked about before. It's just that we're putting together names and formulas now, including the information, but that you have to look it up until you're familiar. Um, of the polyatomic ions formula. So sodium with hydroxide. Sodium is a plus one ion from group one, and so it's combining with hydroxide, which is a minus one OH uh, group, polyatomic ion, molecular ion. Put them together, apparently plus one and minus one, you only need one of each, and AOH works. Magnesium with carbonate. So magnesium is a group 2A element, plus two charge carbonate. Well, we just talked about that a moment ago. It's a minus two ion, CO3 minus two. And so a plus two and a minus two ion, simple enough. You put them together and the formula is MgCO3. Sodium with carbonate. Well, sodium is still plus one and carbonate is still the same thing we had in the previous example. So it's CO3 minus two or two minus. By the way, mastering chemistry is going to uh, probably be fussy if you don't put your um, number in front of your charge on an example if you have to type in a number so be careful about that anyway putting sodium with carbonate you'll have to have more than one sodium to balance out the two negative charges of carbonate put the two together and we have sodium carbonate as the name <coughs> but na2co3 makes it come out to give you an electrically neutral compound last example uh, polyatomic iron with its transition element so iron fe we've seen that now a couple times and if it's iron two, that means it's a plus two iron ion. Say that carefully. And hydroxide is the same as it was on the first example of this slide. So it's a minus one ion. If you've got a minus one and a plus two, it's going to take two of the hydroxides to make the formula come out right. And now you have iron two hydroxide using a parenthesis to indicate that the two atoms together of the polyatomic ion hydroxide occur twice. All right, I hope this helps you as you prepare to work on your homework. I realize that this is tight timing when you're preparing for a test as well, but I hope this all makes sense and gets much better with practice. Good luck. See you in class.